Well, welcome everybody to day two of the Victorian Clean Tech Cluster Expo. Um, my name is Richard Campbell and I'm one of the members of the cluster. I'm also managing director of a company called Hydroterra. Uh, I thought yesterday's session was fantastic. Uh, it's an opening day and I think uh, today's theme uh, makes a lot of sense uh, to continue with, which is all about collaboration and how we can optimise collaboration, uh, particularly in Victoria, but really to see some examples of great collaboration. Today, we have two real experts in this area. We have E4 Park Williams, who is uh, going to talk to us all about clusters and the benefits of clusters. He has worked extensively on those around the world. And uh, really, we're very lucky to have such an expert presenting to us today. We also have Helen Millisa presenting to us today, and she has uh, a different form of collaboration, really headed up by an organisation which is all about getting the ANSPAC Plastics Pack implemented by bringing industry together around a shared purpose. So. We've got two fantastic presenters here today, all presenting on collaboration. Um, the rest of the day we have coming up for us is, or well, the second session today is, how can government enable industry? So a great day coming up today. And I look forward to uh, having a QA and a session at the end of this and look forward to your questions coming through on that. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first presenter, E4. Greetings. Good day to you across the ditch. This is Ivor coming in from New Zealand. Great to be able to come in by, by, by this technology. Thank you, Peter, to Peter Hansford for, for inviting me. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction. Like the way, Richard, in which you use the word collaboration there. And with Anna's help, I'm going to click, going to move my slides forward. Anna, can you pick up my first slide? Here we come. No, you've jumped the gun a bit. Go back. back. Yep, there we go. OK. Can you put that on full screen, or is, is that now full screen? Um, it's clusters, teamworks, it's, it's, it's collaboration, Richard, as you were just talking. What I want to talk about, Anna, next slide. What I want to talk about very quickly, I want to take you into a number of clean tech clusters in Norway, in Denmark, in Canada, in a number of countries. I want to then share with you why are so many countries going down this track of cluster development, a little bit on some of the practicalities of cluster development, and I want to finish with three points as I want, as I think about where does the clean tech cluster in Victoria head to next. So let me start in Norway. Each of these dots on this map of Norway represent a regional specialization, a regional cluster. Each of these communities, and many of them are relatively small, have worked through what are we good at doing in our community? What are our economic strengths? What are the activities that pull wealth into our region? And like the way in which Norway, in which they talk about its clusters for internal collaboration, it's the teamwork, but it's also external collaboration beyond the cluster. I'm gonna take you to one of these dots. It's just south of Bergen. It's a place on a small island small 18,000 people live on this island, so much smaller than a Ballarat or a Bendigo. And this is in part what is going on on this island. Let me take it a bit further. And let's, one more click, Anna. This is a place that describes itself as the world leading cluster for clean maritime solutions. It's a clean tech cluster but a cluster with a very deep, excuse the pun here, a very deep specialization, a maritime specialization. It's a range of businesses and their logos are here. 
it's a range of different public agencies, local government, the regional government in, in their corner of Norway, a number of national agencies, a number of academic here, particularly a vocational training institution. So this is Triple Helix in, in practice, working together, blowing their trumpet, putting themselves on the world stage. My next example takes you a bit south. Anna, a click please, takes you south to Jutland in Denmark. Aarhus, and I imagine many of you have heard of Aarhus, certainly have heard of some of the companies that are based in Aarhus. This is where Vestas a few years ago moved the headquarters to from a, a, another, another corner of the peninsula of Jutland. They are able to say, and able to say really without, without any dispute, we are the world capital of wind energy. And a point I want to make here is that these companies, these competencies are not scattered. Next click, Anna. And, and one more click, please. This is central Denmark, Jutland. As they describe themselves, we are the world's tightest wind cluster and tight in the sense of teamwork. They know each other, they respect each other, but also tight in terms of geography. These companies are not scattered across the peninsula, not scattered across Denmark, yet alone Scandinavia. They have chosen, they have volunteered, or there's commercial benefits for them all to be co-located. Next click. Let me take you to Quebec. And Quebec has a clustering initiative that certainly has some commonalities with what you're developing in Victoria. And I like the way Quebec says, yes, it's wind energy. It is also, click, it is bioenergy amongst their competencies. It is, Anna, it is water. One more coming in. It is agriculture, clean tech. And last one, it's waste. And we'll be hearing from the second speaker about plastic waste. And a question in a place like Quebec is, yes, it's a broad range of co competencies in servicing the local market, like the, the Montreal market, the Quebec market. But there's no way, I suggest, where a Quebec can be internationally competitive in all of these areas. And a question, Anna, next click. A question then for Victoria is, well, what are your hotspots? And I would imagine in a similar way, you've got a broad range of competencies that are developed servicing the local market. But I'd also imagine that there are different things going on in different corners of, of Victoria. Next click, please. I've taken you at some speed into Norway, into Aarhus and Denmark, into Quebec, next click, I could have taken you to a number of other regional clusters in Norway. In Oslo, I could have taken you to offshore wind to the solar energy cluster. Again, emphasizing different things going on in different parts of Norway. Next click, I could have taken you to many other parts of Europe. I could have taken you to Lombardy. I could have taken you to Cleantech Delta in Rot Rotterdam or Flux 50, the one above it that, that is in Flanders, Belgium. I could have taken you to Catalonia. I could have taken you, next click, to a number of places in the US. I could have taken you to the core clean tech cluster, core based in Vancouver, British Columbia. There are many examples here of regional clusters. And a question then in part for you in Victoria is, what's your point of difference? Where might these other clusters be your buddies? And perhaps to some extent you're competing with them, but maybe they could also provide customers for your small businesses, for your larger businesses. Maybe they've got technology that you could draw on that is relevant for your clean tech businesses in, in, in Victoria. So I encourage you to think about these other clusters, a clusters that can fast track your competencies into establishing links globally. One more point here on this slide. You're a late plumber, you're a late comer in introducing a clustering initiative. 
you relate can't come up, but that does give you the opportunity to learn from the experiences of others. Next click, please. Many of those clusters were in Europe, in fact, most of them. Europe, the European Commission has identified some 3,000 clusters across Europe. These are important, firstly, because this is where one in four jobs are. They're also important because this is where, click, please, and the next click, it's in these clusters that we particularly find higher paying jobs, often more technology intensive jobs than the activities that are servicing the local market. Important too, because it's in these clusters that we find the global frontier firms. And finally, it's in these clusters that we see the startups and startups that in many cases become scale ups that are grounded in the region because that is where the ecosystem is that supports that particular business. Next click. Great to see in Australia now a number of the industry growth centers proactive in supporting cluster development. On the left, Food Innovation Australia. And on the right, coming in, I'm sure a number of you are familiar with the hydrogen cluster initiative that NERA introduced late last year. Next click. So what is cluster development about? And I used the word ecosystem a moment ago. In particular, it's about understanding for an individual business, a business perhaps such as yours, Richard, a business that need, has a lot to do within its own boundaries. But what needs to be done beyond the boundaries that can help that business? So it's building the ecosystem, be it training, be it internationalization, be it developing um, underpinning technologies to support a number of businesses. Next click. Four key principles, and I'm drawing here on a handbook that I've written on cluster development. Strong clustering initiatives are business led. It's businesses that typically share the board of a clustering initiative. It's businesses, CEOs from businesses that particularly dominate that board. But it is also, next click, it is also public agencies, agencies plural, coming in and support. And it's often a public agency, such as perhaps the Victoria government is doing here in kickstarting a clustering initiative. Often a public agency, it's the World Bank or, or some other agency around the world that kickstarts. But the sooner, in my experience, that clustering initiative is business led and moves at the speed of business, the more likely the initiative is, the more likely it is that initiative will be sustainable. Next click. It is also knowledge underpinning and knowledge, whether it's public R&D, it's universities, it's vocational training, but it's perhaps high schools in a Ballarat that are doing courses or preparing kids for careers in, 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 in a clean tech environment. And my fourth point here, next click. It is fundamentally about teamwork. It is about cooperation amongst firms. It's about firms respecting each other as competitors and able to work through where might we collaborate in part to bake a bigger pie. Next slide. As, as I finish here, three points. I sense what you're developing with the Victorian Clean Tech Cluster is an umbrella organization. I've emphasized in Norway four clean tech clusters there. In fact, there are others if, 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 uh, um, that, that could be taken into account in, in, in Norway. So I'm picturing an umbrella here for a number of regional clusters certainly in Melbourne, but, but also maybe in, 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 in a Gippsland, in, in a Bendigo, in, in, in a Ballarat, in, in, in different corners. Next click. I'm picturing a culture of business collaboration. I've used the word cooperation to take that a bit further. Co-specialization amongst firms, where firms realize, you know, I don't need to do everything myself. I can outsource this. I can subcontract that. I can focus on what I do best. I can focus on my core competencies. Co-specialization facilitated by trust. And important here, 
geographic proximity where it's relatively easy to meet, relatively easy to have a beer. And my final point here, regional public agencies and academic organizations aligned around the needs of business. I'm describing here a whole range of agencies, some at the Commonwealth level, certainly at the state level, but perhaps at a more regional level too, a whole range of academic institutions that in particular are able to listen. What really are the needs of business and how do we respond rather than those agencies from aloof determining, well, this is the support that we're providing to X, Y, Z. So describing here, it is the teamwork, it is the partnerships. It's getting all our ducks in a row amongst these agencies. On my second point, this doesn't come easy, building cluster collaboration, but the third point is often the most difficult wherever we are in the world. Final click, please, Anna. And my summary slide, it is about swimming together and by engaging together, being able to go after bigger fish. Anna Richards, that's my slideshow. That's what I wanted to introduce the topic with. So happy now to switch over to Helen. Let's hear about plastics. And then if anybody's got any questions, happy to come back in. Hello, I4 and fellow uh, people in clean tech and innovation. Thank you so much, and I thought that was actually the most superb segue I think you could have set up for me. I really appreciate it enormously. Uh, and how appropriate to be, have that as then we talk about plastics and what we need to do in that space. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm just reading Anna's notes. Um, yes, so I'll continue on. Um, I am very honoured to have been uh, selected for a Churchill Scholarship a number of years ago, travelling to Europe and Southeast Asia, looking at circular economy. And one of the things that struck me was, as I spoke about, were the extraordinary collaborations going on in other parts of the world. It was a real lesson for me about the power of many to deal with a big problem. And if we think that climate change is a massive problem and how important it is to reduce emissions and what needs to be done in that area, plastics are actually very much the same. Ubiquitous, emitted in all sectors of society, low cost, very low value for recovery, and yet is absolutely essential because they are indeed part of the carbon cycle. Plastics are a byproduct of oil and gas. And so for us to make any headway with addressing climate change, we simultaneously need to address a more circular society, more circular industry, and especially more circular plastics. So if we're going to be reducing our consumption of oil and gas, we need to be smarter with plastics because plastics are a major byproduct from our oil and gas industries. So what I'm going to talk with you about today is ANSPAC, which is a pact, uh, as I forward uh, outlined, and it is specifically focused on the challenging issue of plastics. As we know, plastics are so cheap that recovery of them is actually non-economic. Uh, it's a greater cost than the use of virgin plastics. So if we're going to move to a more circular plastics economy, as the European Commission found in 2018, then we must embrace a collective model for change. So uh, I am heading up a small team at the moment with the view to establish the plastic pact for Australia, New Zealand and Pacific. Thanks, Anna, if you can move to the next one. So as we know around the world, Plastic waste is a massive challenge. Uh, programs of large and small size are being rolled out by state, federal and local governments, community NGOs, businesses, industry associations, ac academic institutions. And that's great, but the challenge that we have is that this is a, to some extent a fragmented 
effort across the region, which unless harnessed will diminish the rewarding benefits of a more circular economy, plastics. plastics. Collaboration is actually essential if we are going to achieve significant change. Next slide, Anna. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation was established by a magnificent woman. She was the first solo female sailor to circumnavigate the world. And during her travels, she identified that there was plastic floating in the oceans wherever she went. And that was quite some decades ago. She hit upon the idea of establishing a foundation and their first priority was around plastics, particularly plastics that you see in the oceans. And so uh, with that, she established the foundation and a global network, which is now two, three years in um, age. And we have now plastic pacts in all of these different countries around the world. The UK, across the US, France, Netherlands, Portugal, Chile, South Africa, Canada, Poland, and the whole of Europe. And now we're trying to establish one here in Australia to cover Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. Not a small ask, as you can imagine, but we will only do it if we collaborate together. Thanks, Anna. So there are global targets, and every pact has these targets. They are slightly different according to the pact, according to the geography in which it is located. But these, if you looked up the pack, plastic pact targets in the UK or the US or Europe or South Africa, you would see that we're all one family geared towards the same. And they are, and here in Australia, the Australian governments uh, at state and federal level have set these targets. And they are, as you may be familiar with some of these, to eliminate unnecessary and problematic plastic packaging through redesign, innovation and alternative reuse delivery models. So get them out of the system, clean up the system. Secondly, the plastic needs to be 100% reusable, recyclable or compostable by 2025. These are pretty audacious targets. Um, and the emphasis really there is on reusable and recyclable because we need to close the loop and we need to be far more efficient with what we put into the system. Thirdly, increase packaging collected and effectively recycled. Uh, in Australia, we have only something like 18% of all our plastics packaging, which is put into the market each year, which is effectively recycled whether that is business-to-business um, -business packaging, such as um, pickling barrels or large bread crates or IBC containers that are used for chemical uh, transport and storage or uh, the packaging that we receive in our home, it's only 18%. In New Zealand, it's slightly more because they've been running a container deposit scheme for a period longer, but it's not much more. And in some of the Pacific Islands, alas, it is zero. So within each geography, our ambition is to increase it by 25%. And we aim ooh, to put 25% back into, into package, plastic packaging across the region. At the moment, we are very low. I think it's around about 6% if that in terms of recycled content. So to achieve this during the reporting period 2025 is a very audacious task. Thanks, next slide, Anna. So for those that know APCO, which is the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation, ANSPAC is a bolt-on business unit. And our objective is somewhat different to APCO's, and that is to accelerate and really focus the action on plastic packaging. APCO deals with all packaging from glass, metal, fibre, which is cardboard and plastics. ANSPAC is just plastics because it needs special attention. And we're leveraging the whole of the supply chain. So where APCO uh, is predominantly brand owners, we are working, as I4 pointed out, at all points across the supply chain, from the manufacturers to the brand owners, to the retailers, to the collectors, to those that run schemes, to those that are in, in um, an industry's professional association providing training and support to the industry. 
And of course, we have global benchmarking, so we have to report like that. Thanks, Anna. So what are our priority areas for action for the region? Really what we have to do is an audacious and really big task, and that is to create market demand for recyclable plastics and recycled content. We won't do it alone without creating the market demand. So we will be establishing a pledge, a pledge program for companies in the supply chain to work together to some audacious targets to have, lift recycled content. The economics do not stack up, as I said earlier, rather like the challenges that we have with carbon. So it's essential that we drive the change through collaboration. In conjunction with governments and uh, various brand owners and retailers, and uh, we are going to be eliminating problematic, unnecessary items that frustrate and cloud the issue. So the, you will know there's a lot to be said about straws, but it's not just straws. There are other items, far bigger items and challenges that we face in terms of the different types of polymers that contaminate supply. We have challenges in terms of delivery models in order to produce significant quality and quantity. And of course, collection and design. Next slide, Anne. How are we going to do this? Well, we're going to be working in collaboration with companies and organisations. We've got to deliver on those targets. We're seeking people to come forward who want to collaborate on these initiatives. These are some of our kind of priority areas that we seek people to come forward to us on, whether it's stewardship programs, soft plastics, B2B and so forth. We're going to be working on them. Thanks, Anna. Next slide. The regional collaboration is critical, true collaboration, as uh, IFOR spoke about. Uh, we know that this is an industry in a region that has, uh, we trade already across the boundaries and the borders. Um, so we have fair confidence that we will make good headway by collaborating together. Next slide, Anna. Uh, I think that is pretty much a repeat of what IFOR said. Um, we will see changes in investment, jobs. We will see significant success by collaboration. We'll have our co-designed projects. Um, we will show leadership and others will follow. And we'll set up a verification program for recycled plastic materials. Thanks, Anna. Um, I think we can jump to that to the end to, in order to reach end of time. Uh, so there are our details. I'm very happy to have conversations with people about collaboration, about membership and joining ANSPAC uh, so that we can work together to address this critical challenge going forward. Thank you. I for apologies, I couldn't thank you at the time. Uh, a little technical glitch at my end. Look, my we're now heading into the Q and A side of this, and we certainly welcome lots of questions. I, um, as an observation and, and a little bit of a wrap up of what I heard, was that certainly I for's comment about focus is critical, and then. Helen's concept of true collaboration is critical. And you can't have true collaboration without knowing what you're shooting at. And I think that we as the VCC have a exciting but interesting moment where we need to decide what uh, we really want to achieve. And it's interesting to look at the Quebec scenario where they have Mm. any different targets and we all know in any business that too many targets would not achieve extraordinary outcomes. The other thing I really loved about Helen's uh, comments was the comment audacious targets. So to me what that means is audacious is something that's difficult to achieve mm. uh, but it's it's moving us forward. And we are at a moment in time as a world where 
we are starting to question what is audacious and what is critical. And I think looking at Helen's project around plastic, it's critical, right? It's critical. And of course, we have to be audacious about our targets or we won't achieve success, which is a sustainable outcome. Um, certainly, I4's uh, whole premise is that we can work together and overcome competitive instincts. This can be a problem for business, I find, because we're competitors by nature. You know, that's why we started our businesses and I, for one, am motivated a bit by competition. But the resounding learning is you create a bigger pie and you work at what you are best at. And I think look, that's my little sum up of what I heard. Uh, in terms of some questions, they seem to be coming in now. Um, a question first and foremost, they're scrolling up the screen, oh, bear with me. I'm fighting against a stream of questions. Um, question for I4, interesting examples. Thanks I4, in your view, how important is geographical proximity mm. in a post COVID world for effective clean tech cluster collaboration? Mm particularly with the revise of remote work. Ne ne neat starter question and, a, and an important one. So far, there is no evidence that because of the zooming, because of this type of communication we're having between us right, right, right now, we're moving away from the benefit of being in geographically close there is no evidence that a place like Silicon Valley is going into demise. In, indeed, the evidence somewhat is to the contrary for knowledge intensive activities such as clean tech. We need to be able to meet. We need to be able to meet formally, but importantly, informally. We need to bump into each other, whether it's at the co office coffee shop or whether it's at an evening function or we pass each other in the streets in Melbourne. It's the informal com communication that often sparks an idea. It is a culture of co-opetition. And Richard, you're absolutely right in saying it is healthy to compete. And it's, it's competition that in part drives, drives innovation. But it is also very healthy to work through where do we as, as competitors have common agendas, whether it's as simple as or realizing that, well, where are our next apprentice is going to come from? Or how do we put Victoria more firmly on the world map? And it is a pretty, pretty crowded world map already when it comes to clean tech clusters. How do we put Victoria more firmly on that map so that our businesses can more easily make contact with other businesses elsewhere in the world, whether, whether we're talking about um, Aarhus in Denmark or, or, or v v v Vancouver in Canada or, or wherever. Um, so it is this culture of cooperation. One of the key things I try to do with any cluster is let's quickly find some low hanging fruit. And, and maybe Helen, in the, in the work that you've done, the, the, the same applies. A danger is that we're going for things at the top of the tree too soon. Mm. I look for low hanging fruit. Let's find some immediate projects mm. that we can demonstrate. Yes, it's making a difference to our businesses. Mm. And then when we've got some successes, hopefully we've got the energy, the ambition to reach to the humongous projects, the chunky things that are up at the top of the tree. A big mistake I've, I've made, made more than once, is going for things at the top of the tree too soon. Oh, that's a great answer. And I think uh, it makes a lot of sense to find something achievable to get some momentum going for the cluster. Yeah. Uh, another question, uh, I4. How do you think public agencies, state government in particular, can best support businesses to create clusters and help them grow? So the question is, is what is the support? How should, well, 
no government agency should try to invent a cluster. And, and, and you're not talking about getting into nuclear engineering, perhaps in Melbourne, but rather you're saying in Melbourne and Victoria, we've got a lot, we already have a number of clean tech activities, including your business, Richard, including many of the businesses that are participating in, the, in these three days. So, so government is not inventing the cluster. What government is perhaps doing is inventing a clustering initiative that in part winds us together more firmly, helps us identify where are the common pressure points, common issues, where might we lever off each other, helps in part to create the culture, the culture yeah. of cooperation, and a very difficult one for you in Australia. On my side of the ditch in Nelson, in, in Nelson, New Zealand, we have two levels of government. That's complicated enough. You've got three levels even more at times than three levels. It's even more complicated. You've got a clutter of support. And, and, and a, key, a key role for a cluster is to align that clutter of support around the needs of businesses. And, and each of the clusters that I took you to does have a formal infrastructure. There is a cluster manager, sometimes a small team of people who act as the brokers, act as the connectors, don't necessarily act as the project leaders for everything, but yeah. certainly act as the project identifiers because they're able to identify from talking to the businesses and the other organizations, where might there be collaborative agendas? Another good answer. Uh, we're going to keep bombarding you though, I for no rest here, and then we'll okay. get a question for Helen. Um, so thank you for your presentation. Could you suggest the key success factors for a cluster. Uh, clarity around ambition, governance, business model, which international clean tech cluster is doing best? Woo, okay. Um, which clean tech cluster is doing best? That, 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 that's hard, in, in part, because most of those clusters are in a particular niche. And, 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 and that is their focus. The first one I took you to in, in, in Norway, it's not clean tech in general. Aarhus is not clean tech in general. It's not energy in general. It's particularly wind energy. So, 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 so each of these clusters are specialized, but encourage you, if, if you can see the, the logos that I had on that slide, Google, uh, Google those logos, Google those clusters to see what they're up to. And as you're doing that, think through which might be partners for what we're doing in Victoria, which might be our buddies. I could share with you many of the mistakes that I've made. And, and one mistake is governance. And, and I see some clusters, cluster initiatives that have boards, that have steering groups, that are dominated by public agencies. In, in, in my experience, these things need to be business led and business yeah. run and move at the speed of business and need to be comfortable in saying, well, let's try that out rather than woohoo, let's carefully analyze that further. And maybe within a cluster, there's one team looking at a particular type of technology and there's a competing team looking at another type of, looking at another approach rather than, well, let's do a lot of careful analysis to decide which way to go. Describing a culture here of learning by doing rather than a culture of paralysis by analysis. So emphasizing business, emphasizing uh, another key point here, the cluster manager person that I talk, talked about, important that this person is primarily a relationship builder. This is not an analyst. This is not somebody to, do, to write yet another report on X, Y, Z. This is somebody to bring people together to develop a portfolio of action agendas. Thanks, Eiffel. Helen, uh, brace yourself. I have a few questions for you. That's um, all right. Refuse, reuse or recycle, where should the focus be to remove this blight from our oceans and the environment? Can industries respond without government policy? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, what I'm going to do, Richard, is um, add to some of the points that I4 has made, if I can, around clusters and then get to the nub of the issue regarding plastics. 
So what I observed when I was in Europe, which was what IFOR was saying, were that uh, there were quite a number of initiatives and projects which were set up as joint ventures, which were part funded by a range of different companies or, or associations coming together to solve a particular problem or investigate what might be a solution to a problem. So um, if I can give one example in terms of the kind of collaboration that they were entering into was um, the difficulty of finding a way to process soft plastics. Soft plastics are malleable, they come in all different kinds of colours and to find solutions is more than one company can do and it's beyond a policy position of any government. Governments are policy generalists, they are not uh, specialists in particular technologies and so forth. And what I was so impressed by and what ANSPAC is offering is that kind of go-between facilitation kind of solution where, like in Europe, we saw, I was so impressed to see companies coming together or associations coming together and putting a few thousand, you know, 10,000 euros into some kind of project to investigate. And they were, you know, normally they'd be considered as competitors, but they worked collaboratively, perhaps with some government oversight and some government seed funding, because they all recognised that that was a problem that needed to be addressed. So, uh, I think this is, you know, to some extent, the the way we have to go forward here in Australia, I think, is the same. Um, let's be more European in the, and even the way they do things in the US. Likewise, they have um, collaborative projects amongst competitive companies uh, where seed funding is provided by the government for X number of companies to investigate together and collaborate on solutions. So um, in answer to what we have to do with, with plastics, um, yes, we have a major challenge with plastics that end up in our oceans. A vast majority of that is actually not packaging. It has actually things like fishnets, but it is all plastics which do not degrade sufficiently in the environment and they need to be cleaned up. We won't clean them up unless there's a better price on plastics and there is some measures to put in place to clean up the oceans. And that's a physical giant task. It's not dissimilar to the challenge that we have with cleaning up our atmosphere and changing the way we produce carbon emissions from our, our industry and our, our lives. So um, removing the blight from our oceans is a massive task and at the moment uh, it is entirely underfunded by both industries and governments. In terms of stopping what goes into the oceans in the first place, then we do have a greater capacity to deal with that in terms of putting a better price on the plastics so that they don't end up unloved and unwanted in our environment. So it's essential that industries and businesses and government collaborate on those kinds of initiatives. So we put a price on that, we recover it, we've got better material going into the system which has a higher value. So instead of highly disposable single-use plastics, we are going for more durable, reusable plastics, whether it's your keep cup, whether it's your large bottling container, whether it's the pail 20 litre that goes from business to business. All of those, we need to rethink the system. Um, so that's my answer to that particular question. And no, industries cannot respond without government. The Australian government took a very bold move last year where they said no export of unsorted plastics as of the 1st of July this year. So that is putting a major plug on the exit of material from Australia that has previously been sent offshore. Industry is scrambling to work out how to address that. We may well see a significant uptick in the amount going to landfill from the 1st of July. And then it gets even more stringent next year when the government says it must be processed before it can be exported, which means it has to be washed, flaked and pelletized. So um, the industry in Australia is uh, really having to grapple with those the implications of that um, and you know, hopefully we will rise to the challenge.
Thanks very much, Helen. We are running uh, short of time now. I've got several questions uh, left, but I'm going to take uh, take the uh, position of asking one of my own as uh, we're not going to be able to get through all of them. I've heard from both I4 and yourself, Helen, that the uh, role of industry is to lead. Okay, so I've heard industry led, industry led all day. The role of industry associations has typically been to represent industry yeah. groupings. Is there a, uh, a fast tracking by a cluster proactively working with industry associations, do you think? Let me come in first there, Richard. Nice one. It's industry led, and, and let me requalify re this. It is industry led, but at the point where industry takes the lead, it's not government backing off. It yeah. is a partnership. It is a partnership, and I like the word Helen used co designing. It, 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 it is co funding, and I think in, in part, Helen, you, you referred to that. So it's partnerships and, and thinking about a clean tech cluster, it is particularly triple helix partnerships. It, it is academia from high schools through to universities. It is the cluster of government agencies that you've got. It is businesses able to work together and identifying where have we got, com where have we got collaborative, where do collaborative agendas fit in to move our agenda forward? And for any grand challenge and developing a cluster and what Helen is do, uh, doing is addressing a grand challenge by implication or by almost by definition, this is something that we can't address solo. Yeah. We've, got, we've got to buddy up. We've got to even work, yeah. Richard, coming back to an earlier point that you made, we've got to even work with our competitors in baking a bigger pie and then slicing that pie becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think that will... Uh... I, I concur entirely, Richard. There's nothing that I think, you know, I4 and I could be um, on the same, we're pretty much on the same platform with that. And I occur, concur with the point about having um, some easy wins early on and to some extent tackling things like straws, which are, you know, infinitesimal part of the whole one million tonne challenge. But, um, you know, it's a place to start it's a place to move to. There are, uh, we work from that and we bring about wholesale change in other areas, some of which the public may never perceptibly see, but are going on and have to happen. Okay, look, that uh, brings us to the end of our Q&A time. Uh, my role is to uh, wrap up and close this session. I, I have to say fantastic presentations from both Helen and I4. And also there's a bit of a challenge there that's being laid down for us. It's, it's not about sitting back and waiting for others to do this. And industry is, needs to step up. And by industry, I mean each and every business owner who's, who's on here today and the industry yeah. associations that help to represent us. We do need to evolve, and uh, as we've heard from I4, the world is a competitive, crowded place. And, you know, we for many years have made the excuse that we can't do things in Australia for whatever reasons. I think what I've heard today is audacious targets and clear focus, and we can achieve anything, but we do need to do it together. So many thanks to both of you for tremendous uh, presentations and uh, hopefully the VCC, which is um, uh, really coming out of its formative phase into this uh, expo can help to facilitate that leadership that industry needs to bring mm. and those connections between government. I would say that it's a credit to government. They've already stepped up and supported mm. the VCC. So already collaboration is happening. And like Helen said, sometimes it's a lot of little things happening behind the scene that no one ever sees, but it's actually those incidental chats that I for referred to over a beer even, good Lord, uh, which uh, is actually where true change happens. So maybe we can bring the long lunch back in as a place. <laughs> 
right. Uh, thank you very much both for your time today. And I will talk slowly until we hand over to the next session in approximately 30 seconds. But thank, thank you, you Richard. Thank you.